goddess. That guy just casually throws this kind of question at us? What exactly is his deal? But fine, I'll answer, I guess. If it were me, I guess I'd choose to build a cage for the little Charmony dove. After all, leaving it there, it's bound to get hurt by wild animals or something. And that'd just be too sad. It looks like he really has no intention of imprisoning us. If it's just a quiz, I suppose it's fine to humor him. Back to the question. I would personally choose to build the little Charmony Dove a cage. No special reason. I do think that a fledgling should have the right to fly into the sky. But if it can't even live to that point, then there's nothing to talk about to begin with. I can't decipher his intentions right now, but based solely on that question, I would probably choose to build that dove a cage. Even if I was gonna release it back into the sky, it'd have to be strong enough to fly first. If I left it where I found it, I fear it'd never get the chance to fly ever again. I'm happy to see that you made a choice similar to ours. If your mind is made up, let me reveal the outcome of this choice. We passionately nursed it back to health, preparing only the best food for it every day. We even preened its feathers. Later, on the day that Robin left Penacony, we opened the cage door and let it fly back into the sky. I watched it for a long while by the window, probably about three or so days. In those three long days, the little Charmony Dove tried again and again to spread its wings to fly into the sky, but fell to the ground, only to keep trying. Finally, on the 137th attempt, it succeeded. But its attempt did not go perfectly. After flying unsteadily for a while, it fell to the ground, Unable to grasp the direction of the air currents, the fall shattered its wings. It writhed helplessly in my embrace. But it was all for naught, finally succumbing to a painful demise. And in that instant, our tender care, our given love and hopes, they all became the inevitable push that sent it to its death. I deeply regret the choices we made. Next, let us head to the second decision. This time, it's the story of a dream chaser. This story happened when I was appointed as Bronze Melodia, a position exclusive to the Oak family, charged with listening to the problems and vexations of dreamscape residents and providing them with the relevant guidance. It was during that period that I had the opportunity to hear voices from all corners of the dreamscape. Joy, sorrow, arrogance, regret. The complex tapestry of human nature that formed the world. And I was fortunate to catch a glimpse of it. He was a dream chaser and an illegal stowaway. Just like the rest of them, he came to Panacone in search of a better life. Except that, to most people, the price he paid... I suppose you could say it was everything. He told me, I sold everything I could at home. The house, the land, even his two children. He said he could not afford to raise them, and that... At least they could eat if they lived as slaves. He had a plan in place. He would buy back his children once he had made his fortune, and enjoy Panacone's beautiful dream with them. 
alas, his plan to smuggle himself was somewhat clumsy, and he was sniffed out by those pig-headed hounds. After hearing the Dream Chaser's story, I immediately appealed to the Bloodhound family to cease their pursuit. That way, at least he could live peacefully. But I was still too naive to the ways of the world. I did not anticipate that what I thought was a kind gesture would later lead to dire consequences. I'll tell you the outcome soon. For now, I'd like you all to make a choice. Will you do as I did, and try to convince the Bloodhound family to stop their pursuit, so that the Dream Chaser may live peacefully and realize his wishes? Or will you remain silent? leaving him to languish while the hounds are hot on his heels until his inevitable judgment arrives. I look forward to everyone's decisions. Who knows? Perhaps they might even alter the outcome of this tragedy. It seems illegal stowaways are really quite common on Penacony. But that guy in the story... I don't think he deserves any sympathy at all. He sold his kids to chase a dream. Even if he intended to go back for them, it's still insanely irresponsible. With that thought, there's only one choice. Let the Bloodhound send him back home. This person deserves to be punished. Dream Chaser story. If I acted out of kindness, I would probably ask the Bloodhounds to stop their pursuit and lend them a hand. But what cruel repercussion would this choice result in? I think Sunday must have been deeply impressed by the limitations of the strong defending the weak through this incident. Surely it has some connection to the baby bird story. And this connection is precisely the breakthrough Sunday aims to use to persuade us. I'd probably choose to ask the bloodhounds to cease their pursuit. I'm honored to witness you arriving at the same decision. Out of respect, I'll share with you the dire consequences that my choice back then brought about. First, the outcome. He attained major success. After avoiding capture, he ran a business for a few years, very quickly making a name for himself, elevating his status. He might not have become a tycoon like old Artie, but he was considered a character of excellent repute. Now then, did he realize the wish he set out to achieve? No. The last time I saw him was in the real world, where the Hounds were going to permanently exile him, and I was the accompanying Bronze Melodia. The mission was simple. Listen to the criminal's repentance. He told me the reason he was in this predicament was because he conspired to usurp the head of the Alfalfa family. When I asked him about his two children, he instead responded with a question. What children? In the end, my heart aligned with the harmony, and the good deed I dared to undertake held no value, turning instead into a wrongdoing. It created a lamentable oppressor, and countless oppressed individuals. As to your choice, I once again offer my heartfelt apologies. Next comes the third and final decision, and the story this time is my own. This story happened the day I was appointed the Oak family head. At that time, Mr. Gopherwood was the current Dream Master. And, as for his wish, we had a private conversation. 
What surprised me was that the Dream Master had only come to deliver a letter to me. He let me read its contents, and it was a letter from my sister. The letter contained the usual pleasantries, anecdotes from her travels, nothing out of the ordinary. Just as I started wondering how this letter related to our discussion, the Dream Master began to speak. Do you know who wrote this letter? My sister, of course. But why would you personally visit me to hand me a letter from my sister containing mere trivialities? To help you grasp the full scope of this issue. Do you know where Robin is at this moment? From what the letter indicates, she must be in Caspelina 8, correct? She's touring there right now. Correct. Has she mentioned anything about a stray bullet? A stray bullet? What? A war has broken out on that planet. It is because of this very reason that Robin chose this destination. To spread the word of the Harmony. And to save the lives of that planet. She personally made for the front lines. She hoped to ease the people's suffering with song, and was willing to brave mortal danger to deliver the IPC's medical supplies. Unfortunately, stray bullets show no such compassion. Is she all right? If the operation was successful, she should probably be recovering in the field hospital. By the eon above, the bullet struck her neck directly, yet possibly as a reward for her consistent deeds of harmony. It didn't hit any vital arteries. Once you've attended to your outstanding tasks, it'd be advisable to write her back as soon as possible. Those damned savages! I'll pack my bags right away. My gratitude for bringing this to my attention, Mr. Gopherwood. Now you understand why she always wears such elaborate neck ornaments, don't you? How could this happen? Miss Robin? It's all in the past, so please don't worry. I share this in the meager hope that you will understand the Harmony's limitations and predicament. As grandiose as the strong defending the weak sounds, many times, it is nothing more than wishful thinking. Likewise, I've prepared one last question, one last choice. But rest assured, this choice will not have any grave consequences, because this is merely a figment of imagination, a nightmare that has haunted me through countless nights. If you ever had the opportunity to make a choice like I did, would you still support Robin's journey on the path of harmony? that happened to Miss Robin. The strong defending the weak is a great mantra, but if I had to pay such a price, I... I don't know what I'd do. I often feel like I've dreamt of similar scenes on certain nights. In the dream, I see blurry faces. I don't know who they are, but I sympathize with all of them. Fighting for survival against some... unfathomable force. Their confusion and fear are lucid to me. But I also remember... they chose never to give up. Just like Miss Robin. If Mr. Sunday's question leaves you puzzled, you should find the answer from your own experiences. With each trailblaze, dangers and tribulations will surely follow. But would you ever back away? Would you stop March and Don Hung from reaching their next destination? I believe you have an answer of your own in your heart. Miss Robin's courage is admirable. And here 
I was thinking she was just another superstar celebrity. But the fact that she's also Mr. Sunday's younger sister? No, I doubt he'd wish harm on his own flesh and blood, no matter how grand the ambition. <laughs> I see. I am now aware of everyone's stances. Raising these questions merely serves to illustrate one point. The plight of Panacone cannot be salvaged by the Harmony. The true foundation for a sweet dream paradise can only be established through the Order, where the strong govern the weak. I know the suffering of being tormented, the turmoil of losing your way, how sorrow, and even despair, set in when matters don't work out. All of this causes me unending pain, because this is not what happiness is at all. We must teach the weak how to live a happy life, and this life isn't some noble propriety that the upper crust preaches, but in definitive terms, a way of survival that belongs to everyone. So what is your definition of living a happy life? Huh. Good question. Human consciousness is fundamentally an illusion. A cage known as self-worth. People lured in by this illusion make mistakes, yet still ask that external influences bear the burden. When one mistake after the next permeates the masses, they become impossible to trace. Thus, the amassing of these individual cages culminate to form a prison. A place dictated only by the rule of survival of the fittest. Nature is always accompanied by predation and sacrifice. Its antithesis is known as order. That is what I want to do. Unite people's happiness under the banner of order. They won't need to make bitter choices any longer, nor face the weaknesses of humanity. They can cast aside their primal instincts to build a haven for mankind. <laughs> Simply describing thoughts is far too abstract, so allow me to provide a simple example. As you all may know, there are societal norms like weekends, and long weekends that exist on some worlds. During these hard-earned rest days, people are given the chance to extricate themselves from the stresses of everyday life, allowing a certain tranquility to return to their souls. And it is only on these days that people do not have to adhere to the law where the strong prey on the weak. They can live out their lives happily during these brief intermissions, it's just a pity that two or three days are still too fleeting compared to the span of a lifetime. From where I stand, society's ideal system should be seven rest days. Following Sunday, there should ensue a second, a third, and indeed an infinite procession of Sundays. This should be the face of the new world. Idyllic, eternal, peaceful days. And thus, every person can return to their base selves in this utopia. Some gaze in reverence at the stars, pouring their whole beings into calculating the distance between us and the isolated world of Pagana. Meanwhile, some seek refuge in quiet corners, holding one another, unencumbered by the chains of unwelcome obligations. There would be no need to bear the hardships of reality. Only in this way can humanity face the inevitable end with the purest of spirit. Living a life of dignity. This is what it is to live in bliss. Miss Firefly, you who are stricken with entropy loss syndrome, you of all would surely understand this. <laughs> I 
it sounds like a flawless theory. <sighs> But, what is the price to attain all this? The cost is minute. Merely a personal and eternal sacrifice. If this paradise is to be maintained for everyone, someone must remain trapped in solitary awakening until the end of the cosmos. Wakening? Which means that this so-called paradise is still a dream. Stepping into this paradise means forsaking reality, correct? It is not forsaking, but transcending. Flesh, blood, sorrow, weakness. If the physical is the root of spiritual suffering, it is only logical that we defeat it. But in this supposed bliss, people won't have defeated their demons. The chance to overcome their tribulations would be forever lost to them. In other words, it is an escape. That's another way of understanding it. But there is no shame in escape. On the contrary, the seeds of escape exist in everyone's hearts. Don't you agree, Miss Firefly? And as to why we sleep, it is because we are afraid to awaken from our dreams. But this is not in conflict with the grand plan. Only in acknowledging this can we truly understand the frailty of human nature, and from there, show compassion and protection. I... I admit that you are a born leader. Your perspective on humanity brims with pessimism. Yet you express compassion for all. Even when your heart pities them. But unlike you, I live for the self. From my perspective, individuals making choices for themselves is their birthright. The want to escape may be innate in the weak. But whether they are weak or not, it is not up to another to decide. Perhaps in your mind, you also view me as weak? <laughs> because I don't think so. Since Miss Firefly has said her piece, the Astral Express will also naturally give you our answer. We'll leave it to you. Just as Mr. McHale instructed before, tell him our choice. What is this place? Does this place ring any bells, Misha? I... I don't know. But I feel a sense of deja vu. What is this place? It's the realm within a dream bubble. This was left to the Astral Express by a nameless, but weirdly, when we entered it, it was completely empty. Dr. Edward from the Dreamscape sales store told me that dreams are formed from memories, and a dream bubble can't take shape if its core is empty. So I thought you might be able to help us in unraveling this mystery, Misha. As a hotel doorman, you know Penacone best among us. Hmm. I... I don't know much about dream bubbles. But if you want to figure out what this mansion is, I'll do my best. I'm counting on you then. Uh, Himeko, I still don't get it. Why were you so sure that Misha had a connection with this dream bubble? I wasn't sure. It was just a hunch. But since Misha feels familiar with this place... My hunch might be correct. Exactly. This is where you and Firefly encountered death, which we now know as Dormancy. Considering its connection to Dreamflux Reef, it's not surprising it appeared here. The question now is, who brought you here? 
based on the clues we have so far, it's unlikely to be that masked fool. So identifying them is crucial to us. We're drawing closer to the truth once more. Let's give Misha some time, as I believe he'll unveil the secret of this dream bubble. All right, but there are doors all over the place. Which one should we choose? Do you have any idea, Misha? Hmm... I guess... Maybe this way? <laughs> <laughs>